So on this episode of the Leader Smith Podcast, I'm going to be talking to an expert in Ernest Shackleton's, uh, his expedition, what happened, what went wrong, how Shackleton became one of my heroes. Stay tuned. In a world of incompetent bosses, micromanagers, and petty tyrants, you are listening to The Leader Smith. Now, here is your host, Darren Gertis. Okay, so in this episode, we're talking with Jim Kane. Jim Kane is a uh, a trainer. He he's he's written uh, uh, what sixteen books. Jim, is that right? Twenty one so far. Twenty one. Okay, he's he's written more than I thought. Twenty one books, uh, and one of his trainings is uh, team building with historical perspective. In this training, he talks about lessons culled from Ernest Shackleton's life. Now, I found this fascinating because I found an expert in Shackleton. I, I've seen his bookshelf about Shackleton. He's I, I've I've read like two books about Shackleton, watched a couple of videos, and I use uh, one of those videos in class to teach about leadership. He has like dozens of books on Shackleton. I mean, the, uh, yeah, so you're in for a treat. Let me give you a, a, a quick thumbnail about Shackleton. Shackleton was a polar explorer and he was going to transverse uh, the South Pole. And on the way, bad things happen. His ship gets destroyed and his mission changes. And his mission now becomes that he's going to try to do everything in his possible power to save his men. And that's why he's one of my heroes, because he realized that his men were more important than the mission. And Jim, I'm going to turn this over to you. Just tell us whatever nuances you can see or uh, stories that you have or, or what have you. That sounds like a, a beautiful thing. Um, Winston Churchill called Shackleton a glorious failure. He had the very best and the very worst luck of any man ever alive. Yeah. Uh, I've been using Shackleton. I, I Previous to Shackleton, I did a series of uh, leadership scenarios using Michael Usim's spoke the leadership moment. Um, and I talked about Man Gulch, which was a forest fire. And the unfortunate thing with that event is a majority of the participants died in the process of trying to um, outrun a forest fire in Montana in 1949. The Shackleton expedition, uh, by its very nature, everyone stayed alive. And if you look at expeditions to both the North and the South Pole, starting as early as 100 years prior to Shackleton's expedition, um, there was a lot of death. There were a lot of people who didn't survive the journey to make good things happen. And uh, I know, Darren, you mentioned um, the books and things that I've read that are here on the shelf <laughs> behind me. But um, online, archive.org, archive.org um, has a searchable database, and you can download digitally books that have been microfilmed and PDF'd over the years. And that has probably the largest collection of Shackleton books you can find for free on the planet. So it's yeah, a free put that into they the show. Have, yeah. And they even have audio recordings of Shackleton giving a weather report. Yeah. I have no idea why, but that uh, that's on there as well. So if you want to hear Ernest Shackleton's voice, that's a great thing to do. Hey, I'm going to show a quick kind of PowerPoint slide. So I want to share a screen here and, uh, and we'll just chat about this. And for those of you who are listening on the audio only portion of the uh, podcast, um, I, I, everything I'm about to tell you is quite familiar in terms of Shackleton's work. And uh, so here we'll just do a kind of a quick overview of the Imperial Transarctic Expedition of 1914 to 1917. Um, it is rumored, um, but never actually verified, that Shackleton placed a one ad in the newspaper. He was looking to replace um, and, and, and crew out his entire expedition, had a total of 27 positions open on the ship. Um, and there was a a feeling that he had posted a, a help wanted ad saying that men were wanted for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. And it's rumored that Shackleton got over 5,000 applications for those positions, including some women. Now, the British expedition to the South Pole was a naval expedition. So primarily uh, American and naval ships um, didn't allow women on board, but there were North American expeditions that did. So one of the pieces I'll give for the gals in our, our listening audience that would like to know more is there's a brilliant book called Polar Wives about the wives of all these expedition explorers that went, including the women who went in search of the North Pole with their, their spouses, um, which is fairly brilliant. And it gives a woman's perspective on the whole thing. Uh, in case of Shackleton, um, it was really interesting. They outfitted a ship called the Polaris. They renamed it. 
which some people think is a, a very bad idea <laughs> to do, that it's a bad luck to rename a ship. Uh, but they named it after, yeah, they named it after a family motto, and they departed on the morning when England declared war against Germany at the start of World War I. And the British Admiralty was connected, and Shackleton said, hey, you know, I've got about 20 men right here and a good boat. Should we stay? And they said, no, nope, proceed. That was their order to sail forth. And when they got to South America, which was one of their first port of calls down in Chile, um, Shackleton realized that a couple of guys on the boat really weren't working out. They just didn't match the tenor of what they wanted to create. So he fired them and then was hiring people. And one way that expeditions would raise money is they would open up their ship and allow people to come on board and they would talk about what they were getting ready to do. And a few people came on board and they hired two additional crew members. And one of the people that, that uh, wanted to be hired was a fellow named Black Barrel. And um, unfortunately, they felt that he was too young for the expedition and didn't have the required experience. So they left Chile and they're sailing towards South Georgia Island, their last port of call before they head to the South Pole. Um, and about two days out to sea, the cook comes to uh, the captain, Worsley, and says, um, there's a pair of feet sticking out from underneath behind some jackets in my food locker. And uh, Worsley goes down to inspect, and here's Black Barrel. And, and first of all, he must say to him, you know, you try to you try to stow away on a ship going to Bermuda. He says, we're going to the South Pole. Um, and so he alerted the captain. And I just think this is brilliant. Here's a, a comment that was made by Worsley and, uh, about what happened. Upon finding Black Barrel on board as a stowaway, Shackleton, like myself, was rather drawn to the younger youngster. And so it was fixed up. We made him a member of the crew. And I'd like to add that we never regretted the decision. Wow. A lot of uh, stowaways were put in iron. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the fact that the entire crew survived is probably unusual. Yeah. Shackleton told Blackburn in a private moment that he wrote about in his notes because he asked every man to keep a journal. And the book South was written from all those journal entries. But um, Shackleton confided in Blackburn. He says, you know, if things get rough and we have to eat somebody, you're for <laughs> I would have it no other way. So yeah. even in light of all the, the difficulty and tragedy and things that happened, there was a certain lightheartedness to that. Um, when Shackleton got these 5,000 interviews and these um, applications um, from people, he kept them in three drawers in his desk, and the drawers were labeled mad, utterly mad, hopeless, <laughs> and possible. And from the possibilities list, he outfitted the ship, and off they went. Um, to go to South Georgia Island, which is a beautiful facility, now has an airfield and a lot of cruise ships out there these days. But it's one of the southernmost um, islands in the world. And it's in the area they call the Roaring Fifties, mm -hmm. which is where water can circumnavigate the entire earth without hitting any landmass. So wow. the currents are incredibly treacherous in that part of the world. Um, they had more dogs on board the ship than men, mm -hmm. but the sled dogs they had, and the sled dogs were paid for by English school children who, if they raised enough money, could name a dog after their school, which wow. a lot of people realize. So when you think about it, Shackleton was one of the first crowdfunding people yeah. on the planet. Rather than going to positions like the Royal Geological Society and the British Navy, he asked the common people to donate money, and they did. So he was the original quick starter, which is really kind of a fun piece of information. Um, other things that I that I enjoy, and I'm just going to read a few a few passages that that I uh, I really appreciate here. At one point, you know, the ship got stuck in the ice, and it was one of the first days that it happened. And so they were trying to figure out how to to break themselves away, and they they tried to dig themselves out. Um, and I just think this is a brilliant um, journal entry from Worsley, who is the ship's captain. The engines have been unable to move us out of the soft flow of ice in which we are we are jammed. At 9 a.m. Engines are at full stern, and we shall be ship, which means all hands run to one side of the ship, and then they run to the other side, and then they run back again. So back and forth, um, trying to rock the ship to the point where um, it imports a rolling the ship, and so forces her to split the surrounding on ice. This was unsuccessful. So all hands muster the poop deck, and on a rhythmic time, they try to jump up and down to create this. Uh, which created much hilarity, but it had no desired effect. <laughs> uh, I, I want you to leave you with the idea that even though they were in a difficult situation, these were people who knew hard times. Mm -hmm. uh, and with the coming of the First World War and a chance to work together like this in Arctic Adventures, and some had been on previous adventures, 
there's really a lot to be said for how they kept morale up. Uh, when Shackleton interviewed people, one of the people he interviewed played the banjo. And he says, well, why do you want me to bring the banjo? He says, we're going to spend months in total darkness down there. He said, I want to be around people who are interesting. And being able to play a musical instrument and have recordings are, are absolutely essential. Darren, is there anything you want to kind of ask me at this point? Or I, I can continue. No, just, That's just keep going. This is great stuff. It, it, you know, and I'm going to share this with my class as well because the context is just it's wonderful. So uh, this is one of the shows. Shackleton th didn't sleep especially well. And he was one of these people like Henry Ford who spent a lot of hours of the day awake. So on the different ship um, commands, he would come and visit the crew. Um, and this is one of the, the pictures that was saved by Hurley. You have to understand, Hurley was the, uh, the, the ship photographer who also had a motion picture camera. So there were movies of the event, including mm -hmm. when, the, uh, when the sails and the masts came down on the ship when it was being crushed by the ice. Um, and one of my favorite photos is the one I'm showing on screen now, which shows a series of men gather around the fireplace. And if you look at the image, you'll see that there's about five people there, but there's actually a sixth person. And when they digitized the photographs that came out of this, inside the uh, the smoke on the back, there's a sixth person there and you can see his face um, through the image. Hurley at one point had taken all these photographic slides on glass plates and had stored them in the ship's food locker to keep them cold because the rest of the ship, you know, was heated to some extent. Um, and when the ship sank, uh, one day Shackleton, when they hadn't yet um, departed that area, Hurley realized all his photographs were down in the ship's locker, which is now below water. He stripped to the waist in the Antarctic or the Arctic, uh, Antarctic, and um, and dove below the water to recover the plates, and recovered wow. about four hundred plates, glass plates. Well, they must have been heavy. Um, and then from those, they kept thirty. Mm -hmm. And the, and the rest were left behind, um, which is really kind of sad because. But he he kept some amazing ones. Hurley, just a, a side note, uh, also did photography in World War One and several other one of Mawson's expeditions. But he was a bit of a special effect artist, and most of the Antarctic sky was kind of gray and kind of lifeless. So he had brought pictures of the sky from England and would superimpose them on the background to give some color and some breath. And one of the photographs, someone saw a bird, and they're like. Are there birds in the Antarctic? And it's like, no, that's actually from my backyard in England. But he was kind of a special effect artist, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, one of the things that they did that they had photographs of, and they're well photographed, so these are all preserved. And you'll find them on websites like the Royal Geological Society. Um, on Saturday night, they had what they called a shave and a haircut party. And just to do something fun with the men in addition to playing music or cards or other forms of entertainment, um, they gave each other you know, shaves and a haircut. Uh, afterwards, they said they look like um, prisoners from a, uh, a prison that had been shaven so closely. But um, they found ways to to keep you know, a certain amount of levity to it. Um, they played volleyball. Uh, they started off playing soccer, and then someone got kicked in the shins, and they decided that having a broken bone in the South Pole would be a bad idea, so they quit playing that. Yeah. Um, so they kept on going, and uh, as, as people know, they got stuck in the ice on the ship, and... Uh, Hurley just had some amazing photographs, including some night photographs of the ship that were taken. Uh, at some point, though, uh, rather than having the ship kind of spit out by the ice and laid on its side, it was crushed to the point where it was unusable. And then Shackleton realized, we need to get people out of here. We, I need to rescue the men. So they took the three boats. Um, the shortest one was about 14 feet in length. I think the longest one was about 22 feet. And they took the men and they started transporting these ships um, north to try and self-rescue themselves. There's a place called Elephant Island where whaling ships came by and they were hoping that they could get into the ship. Um, I think the thing that's, that's so interesting for me is any single element of Shackleton's expedition by itself was a huge adventure, but they just got stacked on over and over again. You know, they sailed south. It was hard enough getting there. The ship was lost in the ice. They, they survived trying to get um, where they needed to be until the spring thaw in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, they made it to Elephant Island, which was in itself five days in rowboats. Just try to imagine spending five days in a rowboat. Um, that by itself was amazing. They made it to the island. Then they that's decided the, that- That's the ahead. easy part. <laughs> I know, I know. And if you've seen pictures of Elephant Island, there is nothing there. Although the Chilean government now has a monument there for Shackleton. Yeah, five days in that rowboat to Elephant Island is the easy part compared to what comes next. I mean, I that's the amazing well, so, thing. 
yeah, they decide, okay, here's the, and you think it's going to be, okay, this is the final piece to get us rescued. They outfit the biggest ship. They make higher size to it. They make it seaworthy as possible. Um, and then they're going to head off to Elephant Island um, with Worsley, the ship's captain, um, with Shackleton and, and three of the crew. Um, and it's, I, I forget what it was. It was at 1,700 miles by open sea in the Something roaring like 50s. It's never been done before. <laughs> uh, open waters. I mean, it's just like, and, and he has to do it by dead reckoning. Uh, I, that's I mean, the hardest part. Yeah. And here's the thing. If you're off by one degree in 1,000 miles, that's 17 miles that you're yeah. off course. And Elephant Island is only 15 miles long. You could literally miss it. And if you miss Elephant Island, the next landmass is Africa, 3,000 miles away. Yep. And, and they actually did a recreation of just that part of the journey, which is amazing. So on the ship they go. And sure enough, they hit Elephant Island. But now they're on the west side of the island. And the whaling station is on the east side. So it, it just keeps getting better and better. So at this point, Shackleton and a guy on his crew named Cream, um, who was an Irishman, is viewed as being... He was the positive attitude guy. Everybody yeah. who's in a great leadership role needs somebody behind them who's encouraging them. And Crean's role was to be the guy saying, I don't care how hard it gets, we can do it. You know, mm -hmm. and he was that guy who just kept a positive attitude and was one of the three. So they decide now on the west side of the island, they broke the rudder off their little boat getting to shore um, and it was unsailable. So they decide now they have to walk over these uncharted mountains in the middle of South Georgia Island to get to the whaling station that's on the other side. And they got disconnected. They did bring a tent. Um, before they left Elephant Island, this is very Shackleton, he gave his shoes to somebody and took the worst pairs of shoes. He said, yeah. I'm going to be in a boat. I'm not going to need my shoes that much. You guys need better shoes here. Um, so he and Crean and another individual, I think it was Worsley, walked over the mountain range to get to the whaling station. And they got lost in the process. At one point, they laid a rope on the ground, poured water on it. It froze. They formed a sled, and they slid off in the darkness, figuring we're either going to get there or we're going to die trying. And uh, the last thing, they could hear the whistle from the uh, the starting whistle from the whaling station. And they had to pass through, yes, waterfall to get to where they needed to go. Now, you know, ice-melted snow is going to be you know, very much at the freezing temperature, they finally make it to the whaling station, soaking wet in clothing that they've been wearing for the last nine months. So as they're walking into town, they're trying to cover up the various parts of exposed skin they have because they look like a bunch of vagrants um, and they make it to town. And that was just the beginning of the process to get everybody rescued and safely back to South America. Um, absolutely unbelievable. During one of their ex exhibitions, I'll, I'll read from Worsley here. Um, they, uh, they ended up not being able to transport these giant rowboats with them um, because they were just too heavy. So the area of ice that they were on was actually spinning and, and wound up spinning itself out the north of the, the Antarctic continent. Um, but they were asked to give up a lot of their possessions because they couldn't carry a lot of weight with them. Um, mm -hmm. And Worsley had um, collected a bunch of cards that people had tossed out. At this period, the monotony had become terrible. This is a place they called Patience Camp. Fortunately, before the endurance sank, I retrieved three packs of cards. One of these was Shackleton's own, but this did not present me or prevent me from presenting it to him with morally generosity, for which he thanked me very much. Another I gave the men, and the third I kept for my own tent. These cards proved a godsend. I once worked out that they were worth about two pounds a card to us, which would be about $10,000 a deck today in present um, mm. things. I just want to share one more point here. Um, I mentioned that. Uh, there were a lot of difficult times, and I'm sure um, it was a incredibly trying experience, but sometimes luck was on their side. And this is one of the events that comes from Worsley's journal. He said, um, Wild, who was the second in charge, shot a sea leopard, a seal today, which had swallowed 30 fish. We extracted these fish, cooked and ate them. Turns out that two of the fish weren't salvageable, but the rest had just been freshly eaten. So they had 28 fish for the 28 men. Curious wow. enough, two of the fish had been partially digested, had to be thrown away, leaving us with just 28, the exact number of our party, so that each man had a splendid meal of one whole fried fish. Wow. Unbelievable.
Hey, so tell me this, when you're doing your team building with historical perspective workshop, what, what kind of, what are the fundamental lessons you're trying to drive through with all of that background, which is awesome. I mean, if anybody has seen, read the book uh, South or read about Shackleton or seen the documentaries, uh, uh, I mean, this all, it's coming to life, right? What are you trying to, to communicate through? Like, what's the bottom line that you're trying to, to teach? couple of things. I try to use the re, uh, the historical events that Shackleton did. For example, when they sallied forth in the ship and ran back and forth and then jumped up and down, I do a team building activity where I place people on a tarp and working together with one of their teammates, they try to jump in unison so their teammate can pull the tarp off from underneath them. It takes timing, it takes communication, a little bit of problem solving. So I use the historical perspective of what they did to keep together. Um, mm -hmm. the, flack, the fact that, you know, when Black Barrel joined them, Somebody had to give him their winter clothing. He had to have a bed that they hadn't planned for. You know, he needed a job to do that was part of the process. People had to make room for this additional person that they hadn't considered. Um, and he made a place for himself on the ship. So this camaraderie, teamwork, all those elements add into, and I try to use activities that reinforce real life things that have happened. So the historical perspective was great. And, and here's a good example. Um, Frank Wilde was Shackleton's second in charge. Mm -hmm. And when you read about him, um, he, anywhere Shackleton went, he was with him. And in fact, Wilde died, I think, in the 30s. And you know, Shackleton died on his final expedition to uh, the South Georgia Island. Um, they have now exhumed Wilde's body and placed him next to Shackleton on oh, South wow. Island. And here's the thing. This is so much fun to share. This is what made Wilde help Shackleton on a previous expedition with Scott to the South Pole, the unsuccessful one, the Terra Nova expedition, um, they ate a mixture of pemmican, which was kind of fat and oatmeal and other products. And literally, it, it didn't pass very easily through the digestive system of most people. So Shackleton, Wilde was having a problem with that. So Shackleton gave Wilde his morning breakfast biscuit, which you can see is not a very substantial thing. And yeah, this is the one. This is the one that they say in the documentary. You would, uh, you would lick at breakfast and suck on at dinner, and then finally <laughs> uh, suck on at lunch, and then finally eat for dinner. It was a very simple thing, but it was all that Wild had, and Shackleton gave it to him, and would have forced a second one on him if Wild had let him. He says, "I don't know if I can explain how much generosity was, but yeah. basically, anytime Shackleton wanted to go, so you think about the things that these people did that literally bound them together." And that's what good team building is. Yeah, and they and were probably the world's best explanation of what that looked like and their ability to keep each other alive, to keep each other going. It was just it was an incredible thing. I, I can't imagine. It's it's hard not to be loyal to a leader that is going to look out for you. I say in class, like if you, if you want my heart, show me get, if you give if, if you have my back, you get my heart. Right. And, and so that, I mean, so think about Shackleton, like giving him his, his breakfast ration or his, his, yeah. uh, his biscuit ration, or, um, you know, when they're, when he's realizing that a, a man is, uh, so cold and he really needs coffee, he was ordering it for everyone so that he wouldn't have that man lose face. I mean, those kind of things, it's hard not to be loyal to somebody that is that good of a leader. And so I, I can see where you can get all kinds of great team building exercises. Oh, yeah. Stories are wonderful. Yeah. Uh, any one final thought? What's what's the highest, best thought? I mean, this is a hard thing to ask, right? About everything shackled. Thomas Pynchon had a quote at the end and uh, of, of all this work. And he says, you wait. Everybody has an Antarctic. Everybody has an event in their life that is going to test them and their mettle. So when I work with teams, and I, I'll give you a true story. I work with a biotechnology company. Um, in Massachusetts, and we had looked at the scenario, and we were talking about things, and I had given them that, that comment about, you wait, because everybody goes through this. Um, and two weeks after our event, the company was bought out, and people were laid off. Mm -hmm. I mean, out of the blue, they had this event happening after they had done the Shackleton thing. So what they did was, they would get together every Tuesday morning, the entire group, and there was about 16 of them, and they st kept doing that until everybody had a new job, and they would help each other interview because that was how they bonded together that was their anarch so i like that idea that um through these great struggles that have gone through by people a hundred years you know prior to us we can learn things that can help us in our present day including something as simple as the viruses that we're going through now and some of the 
the global situation, yeah. you can learn things from other people. Um, and it's so well documented. And there are so many resources and photographs and movies of the event. It's it's just an amazing experience. So, you know, I think you have the better quote. So I always end every podcast with a quotation for contemplation. And I think you have the better one this time. Um, I was going to uh, give Lincoln's quote about how nearly all men can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man's character, give him power. And Shackleton was a great leader in power, making really hard decisions all along the way, but always focused on the outcome, you know, having the back of his men. And uh, but I think you preempted me. <laughs> I, think, I think your quote's better. So we'll go with that. <laughs> so, hey, listen, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking about Shackleton. Um, when we were talking earlier, you were telling me about how now you do these trainings in person and now everything is shifted to a virtual environment. Yes. Are you willing to come back on another episode and uh, and tell us about what that's like? Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, thanks so much for coming on again. And, and I hope that for our listeners, this helps you become the kind of leader that you would want to follow. Thanks, Dan. Have a great day.